Welcome to the show. We're talking about divine simplicity today with two really cool guys. One of them is Joe Schmidt, who's been on the channel before. He's an agnostic, if you can believe it. And we're talking about, is divine simplicity true? And today I'm, I'm also joined by Chris Thomas Wesky. Thomas Wesky? You're going to have to help me. Tom, Thomas Shevsky. Thomas so Shevsky. Yeah, the S is, the S-E is pronounced like an S-H and the W is pronounced like a V. I'm going to call you Chris. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's what most, that's well, what most people do. Good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very rare that I have somebody who has a more complicated last name than me on the show, but today is that day, I guess. Well, uh, like I said, we're talking about divine simplicity, so we're going to define what that is. But first, we're going to introduce the guest. So Joe's been on before, and I'm going to have him actually start and just kind of introduce himself. But then I also want him to explain what his view is on divine simplicity. And the, the reason why I want him to start is because he's not even a Christian, okay? He's not a theist. He's an agnostic. He's not an atheist. He's not... He's not uh, that far away from God, but he is an agnostic. And so it makes it a little bit interesting that he's engaged in a dialogue on classical theism. So I'm going to let him explain why he's interested in this. And then we'll move to Chris and then we'll just uh, get the dialogue going. Yeah, so um, I'm Joe Schmid. Uh, I'm a student at Purdue University. I study philosophy and biology. And um, I've got a YouTube channel called Majesty of Reason and a blog by the same name and a book by the same name as well. So... Um, I'm really interested in divine simplicity, mainly because I find the debates concerning models of God just, <laughs> yes, yes, let's go. <laughs> uh, it's Super good, though. Well. Oh, it's up there. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just really interested in debates concerning different models of God, like what would an ultimate reality look like uh, if there is such an ultimate reality? Like, um, would it be absolutely simple, purely actual, things like that? Would it be an intellect? Would it be personal? Would it care about us? Um, so all these questions are just super fascinating to me. Because, um, you know, if you're going to reject God's existence, for instance, you need to know what model of God you're rejecting or the various models on offer. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, just God. Like, you know, which model of God? Things like that. So, uh, yeah, that's that's mainly my story. Yeah, and it's kind of a conditional claim. It's right, like it's... If I'm going to slow down here. I'm actually drinking coffee because this one, I feel like it's going to pull my brain in, in ways that other discussions don't. But so the, for for you, this is kind of a conditional thing. It's like if God exists, then he would be this area or he wouldn't be this way. And so it can still interest you. You know, the conditional claim can still really interest you. And I think that that's sort of what, what explains your interest in, in divine simplicity. All right, Chris. So let everyone know who, who you are and then what is your stance on divine simplicity, kind of why you hold that view. And then we'll get the dialogue started. Sure. Uh, so I am a PhD candidate at Baylor University. I'm working with Alex Proust on my dissertation, uh, which is about why human beings don't survive in the interim state between death and resurrection, even though their souls do. Um, and uh, my view on divine simplicity, uh, yeah, I guess just by way of further introduction, more broadly, I do metaphysics, philosophy, religion, and medieval philosophy, especially Aquinas. Um Concerning divine simplicity, um, I hold it as a as the conclusion of uh, many philosophical arguments and also as an article of faith. Uh, I'm Catholic, so it's a dogma for me. Um, but I'm also an Aristotelian Thomist, more or less, in my uh, broad philosophical outlook um, on most issues. Uh, and so I find the philosophical arguments um, for divine simplicity convincing as well. So let's go ahead and divine, uh, define what divine simplicity is really quickly. And so I also want to mention that we have a discussion brief between Joe and Chris actually linked in the description of this video. And it's like, how, how many pages is it? I actually haven't checked. It's 10 pages of a discussion brief that they prepared in preparation for today's dialogue. And it's actually really detailed. There's a lot of information there, and it's all free, of course. So just check the link in the description if you want to kind of follow along. It has some helpful definitions and some distinctions that are made in the whole dialogue and everything that are going to be really helpful. So I highly recommend, as you're watching this, even if it's on your phone or if you're on your desktop, try to pull it up, and it might help as you're going through this conversation today. And so with that in mind, they have defined divine simplicity in this discussion brief, and it says this, divine simplicity affirms that God is utterly non-composite. He has no physical, metaphysical, or logical parts. So that's the basic definition of what divine simplicity is. So Joe, I want to turn it over to you. 
unless Chris, you'd like to, to jump in. It, it almost sounded like you did. Well, let's start with, uh, no. yep. okay. Let's start with Joe. What are, what are some of your biggest problems with divine simplicity? Yeah. So before going to some of the problems, it might be useful to like get clear on some of like the different forms of composition that uh, classical theists deny of God. So uh, before doing that, I think it would be helpful to go through these different kinds of composition. Um, okay. So I guess one kind, the first kind, would be uh, a distinction or composition between supposit, that is to say the whole substance or individual, and essence or nature. So uh, classical theists will affirm that God is identical to God's essence or nature. God is his essence or nature. So that's one of them. Um, and I guess uh, I could just, you know, briefly run through these other ones. Um, so uh, another one is subject and accidents. So again, um, there is a distinction to be made between different predicables that we can say of God. That is to say, things that we can predicate of God, like God is omniscient and God is omnipotent. We might mean different things by those. Um, versus, on the other hand, true properties of God, whether essential or accidental properties. And what the doctrine of divine simplicity says is that God has no accidental, which means non-essential, features or items or properties, but he's also identical to all of his attributes, and all of his attributes are identical to one another, such that God is just this single, subsistent act. You know, he doesn't have distinct attributes or properties. Uh, he doesn't have distinct essential attributes or accidental attributes. So that covers subject and attributes. Um, there's also no distinction in God between agent, or God, and his action or actions. So God is his action. God is identical to his single, intrinsic, wholly realized action across all possible worlds. There is no unexercised causal power in God. Everything is sort of fully realized about God. Uh, and he is his action. He really, what classical theists say is God is act. God is an action. Another distinction or kind of multiplicity that is denied by the doctrine of divine simplicity is essence and existence. So what classical theists are going to want to say is that God is the subsistent act of being itself. He is pure, undifferentiated, unqualified, unadulterated, unconditioned reality or actuality or being. God's essence, that is to say what God is, is identical to his essay, that is to say his act of being or existence. So God just is existence itself, really, under classical theism. Um, and then finally, uh, we have act and potency. Um, and so really, that's, that's just to say that in God there is no potency. God is purely actual, utterly devoid of unrealized possibilities of being. Um, anything that God could be, God fully and, and wholly is. He realizes that. Um, he's unchangeable in that regard. Uh, he has no unrealized, intrinsic, real capacities or, or capabilities. Um, yeah, so, and then there's also the form-matter composition. So God's not a compound of form and matter. He's just pure, subsistent form. And that's a sort of technical Aristotelian point, but um, uh, maybe Christopher wants to jump in and, and just point out that a lot of these are sort of subcategories of act potency distinctions. Right. So yeah, uh, me and Joe wanted to do this um, episode together in part because uh, like, I think a lot of the discussions that happen surrounding divine simplicity um, just uh, start off with that definition of uh, no composition or no parts. Um, and then jump into the arguments for or against the view. Um, and it's, it, it's worth noting that, you know, in the history of the doctrine, there have been certain kinds of composition that classical theists have been particularly uh, concerned with, right? Um, the, the, the several kinds that, that Joe just listed. Um, and it might be helpful, I think, uh, to Christians who are trying to deliberate about classical theism to think individually about each kind of composition and decide if that's something they have an objection to or not. Um, and in this way, they can kind of focus their thought about the doctrine um, uh, more narrowly uh, instead of feeling like they have to uh, accept the doctrine wholesale all at once without fully understanding what it uh, what it all entails. Um, I will just uh, note um, a couple things. I think most of uh, almost everything Joe said is is basically right. I just want to um, flag um, one thing concerning essence and existence. Joe said that God is because of divine simplicity. God just is pure existence, and that's right. But it's important to note here that that doesn't mean God. It, it, that's not a kind of pantheism, right? When, when we say that God is. 
existence, we mean he is his own existence. We do not mean that he is the existence of creatures. So like I have existence, Joe has existence, um, my table here has existence, and so on. And God is not the existence of those things, right? So God is not uh, just a, some kind of pantheistic um, collection of, of the existences of all, of, of all creatures. Um, we just want to say that he's his own existence. It's just a really um, important qualification there about the about the view, because uh, I think that the view that he is the existence of creatures is ab as absurd as it sounds. Um, and then I, I do want to also note that there's a theme play, uh, at play with uh, all these distinctions between supposit and nature, between subject and accident, between essence and existence and so on. Uh, which is that they're all conceived, at least in the Aristotelian classical uh, theist tradition, as um, div dividing lines between act and potency. So, uh, you know, supposit uh, is um, the uh, actuality of a particular essence or uh, uh, of, a, of an essence or nature, and accidents actualize the potency and subjects and. Uh, existence actualizes essences and so on. Um, so there's a reason that the lines are being drawn this way, um, at least in the Aristotelian tradition. Uh, and it's worth uh, keeping that in mind as we talk about each kind of composition and uh, what the reasons might be for or against accepting, uh, excluding that kind of composition from God. I have a question that I would like to ask just about the, the topic in general. And I've never understood this, Chris. How can someone think that all of God's properties are the same or like one property. I've never understood really? how God could be omniscient and, you know, and all powerful and how those two properties could be exactly the same thing. It's just never made sense to me. Sure. Um, so I think this is another common, uh, this is connected, I think with another mi common misconception about the doctrine, which is, uh, so again, let me let me qualify. What I'm about to say is true in the Aristotelian to mystic classical tradition. Scotists and other people who don't like analogy um, uh, as much as uh, uh, Aristotle and Aquinas did um, might not be on board with this. But I, as a, as as someone with broadly to mystic um, uh, sympathies, think that the doctrine of analogy. Uh, about positive predications of God and the doctrine of divine simplicity go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Um, or at least you certainly can't have simplicity without analogy, for the reason that you just mentioned, Cameron. Um, we do not want to say that um, in God there's something called knowledge that is univocally predicated of God and us, and also something called power univocally predicated between God and us and that in God those two things are distinct um, that would be plainly uh, sorry that in God those two things are identical even though in us they're distinct that plainly would be I think um, absurd um, because it's very plain that our kind of power and our kind of knowledge um, are the kinds of things which insofar as creatures have them at all they have them as distinct properties. So when we say that in God, power and knowledge are identical, what we that's really shorthand for the following formula. Um, in God, there's something like knowledge, um, and that thing is identical to something like power. So we're not saying that power is knowledge. That would be absurd. We're saying there's something in God like power, like our power, like what we understand as power. And that thing is identical to something that's like what we call knowledge, what we know as knowledge as exemplified in creatures. Um, so we're, we're actually saying there's, there's, um, that there's just one thing in God, right? God himself, his own essence, that in some way is like creaturely power and is like creaturely knowledge and is like creaturely love and so on. Um, uh, obviously there's a lot more that can be said about that. You know, there's lots of books on analogy and so forth. Um, but that at least I think dissolves the prima facie appearance of outright incoherency. Uh, we're not saying that creaturely properties become identified in God. 
nor are we saying that God is a property, um, as, as Plantinga has uh, famously accused the doctrine of entailing. Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, I don't, I don't have anything to, to add to that, but um, I, I would like to get into sort of the, the classical theist understanding of parts before we get into certain problems. So is it okay if we move on to that, Cameron? Oh, absolutely. Okay, okay. So basically, um, before going into our arguments, it's really, it's really good to get clear on what we mean or what the classical theist tradition means by parts. And so we just went through a lot of different examples, but of course, you know, that doesn't really facilitate automatically a precise definition of it. So one recent and useful characterization runs, anything intrinsic to God is identical to God. And that's uh, from philosopher Omar Fakhri that is forthcoming uh, in an EJPR article. Now Fakhri uh, points out that this is a straightforward entailment of absolute divine simplicity. More generally then, uh, we could understand a part of S some subject or supposit S, as some positive ontological item intrinsic to S, but distinct from S. Okay, now, um, by positive ontological item, I just mean something that has reality, something that exists in some sense. Um, and by intrinsic, intrinsicality is actually kind of tricky. Um, so a rough sketch would be something like intrinsic features or predications characterize things in virtue of the way they themselves are, Whereas extrinsic features or predications characterize things in virtue of their relations to other things outside of them, as it were. Um, yeah, so you can think of intrinsic predications as true in virtue of how the thing is in itself, whereas uh, extrinsic are true in virtue of something outside of S to which S relationally stands. Now, this understanding of parts is, is pretty much in marked agreement with uh, the doctrine of divine simplicity as traditionally articulated it. Articulated. Augustine famously put it as God is what he has, and that's in the city of God. Um, other thinkers like um, say whatever is in God is God, like strictly identical to God. Bill Valicella articulates it um, as, again, nothing intrinsic to God is distinct from God in his Stanford Encyclopedia article. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of flag that this is really the commitment of, of classical theism to this understanding of parts. And so it's really helpful to outline that before getting, in, getting into the certain um, problems and maybe uh, motivations for divine simplicity. So if you're just joining us, I want to remind you that we have a discussion brief linked in the description of the video. You can pull up and actually read and follow along. A lot of the things that Joe and Chris are going to be talking about today are already outlined in this brief. And so it's going to be a real helpful tool for you to help follow along the conversation today. Just want to remind you that it's in there. Go go open it. We already have a bunch of people actually have it open right now. So that's really cool. So Chris, would you like to say anything, clarify, disagree? Uh, that's pretty close to what I would say. I, I, would, I guess I would add one word to the formula. Uh, anything intrinsic to God is really identical to God. Um, and the key words there, right, really are intrinsic and really. So um, the, re the reason really is important is because, of course, um, the doctrine of divine simplicity is completely compatible with us making lots of conceptual distinctions um, between God's power, God's knowledge, God's love, and so forth. And in fact, I mean, I think that the classical tradition is going to want to say that God, because he is um, being itself, is the ultimate um, source of uh, material for conceptual distinctions. Uh, you can make more conceptual distinctions in God than you can in, in any creature, because he just has more uh, content, so to speak, uh, in him. Um, and so the, the word really is, is important there, right? We can conceptually distinguish between God's power and his knowledge. And of course, it's worth uh, also noting there that when we say that we can distinguish between God's knowledge and his power conceptually, we don't mean just a purely logical distinction, like between, like when we say that Venus is the morning star and Venus is the evening star. Um, that's really just a difference in words. What we, what we want to say is there's, there's a, even though these things are really identical in God, um, the conceptual distinction is not just a matter of giving two different names to the same thing. It really is picking out, um, uh, you know, feature features of God that that the mind is, is is tracking accurately when it when it when it says, oh, there's power in God, oh, there's knowledge in God, and so on. Uh, and the word intrinsic is also very important there, because um, uh, I 
at least on my understanding of the doctrine of divine simplicity, and I think uh, at least Aquinas' understanding, there's no problem at all with um, attributing extrinsic change to God, for instance, or extrinsic um, contingent properties. As long as it's an extrinsic, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, go hog wild, put whatever contingent changing things, uh, make whatever contingent changing predications you want of God, as long as they're extrinsic, because I think what we're doing in extrinsic predication is we're really just um, uh, changing around the parts of a prop, the, 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 the subject and object of a proposition, um, which is fine. Uh, but when we're making, the, the idea there is when we're making extrinsic predications of God, we're really talking about other things. We're talking about creatures, right? So um, we'll talk about knowledge in a little bit, and I'm going to defend an extrinsic view of that where, you know, when I say that God knows certain things about me, I'm really making claims about about me in a, in a certain way, um, uh, and and not uh, about God, it, to be clarified. Anything to add there, Joe? Um, yeah, well, mainly just that we're going to touch on a lot of these um, aspects of the debate later on, uh, so... Um, but yeah. we might we might just sort of briefly start to go through the the primary motivations of divine simplicity because we we did want to make this section kind of kind of brief just to at least outline to people why some thinkers are led to divine simplicity in the first place before going to certain problems for it. Um, so maybe we maybe we can uh, move on to that if that's cool. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Christopher, do you want to briefly lay out the aseity, um, you know, motivation for divine simplicity? Sure. So, you know, what, probably the most commonly cited motivation for divine simplicity is divine aseity. Um, we want to secure uh, God's complete and radical independence from everything else that does or could exist, uh, right? This, this is this very, I think, bibli biblical and also uh, philosophical theist intuition um, that— uh, most people have about God that if there is a God, um, he's the first being. He's what is most metaphysically ultimate in, in reality. He is the source uh, and summit in some way of uh, every other being that exists. Um, and so we wouldn't want it to end up being the case that God in some way depends for his being uh, whether that's his substantial being or his accidental being, his his existing at all, or his having certain properties, uh, real intrinsic properties, we wouldn't want any of that to depend on something that's not God, um, right? We want him to be ase from himself. Okay, so the idea then is that if God had parts of the kind that we described above, then he wouldn't be ase in this way. There'd be something that's not God on which God depends in a certain way. Um, now, the sense in which God would depend uh, on his parts, I think, does depend on which parts you're talking about, and that's kind of why we wanted to break it down by the various kinds of parts that you might think uh, compose God. Um, and I think at this point, Joe has some... Uh, some brief um, non-classical responses to to mm -hmm. this general line of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, there are roughly, well, in the literature, you know, there are lots of different ways to go about it. Um, one one brief response that some have leveled is to distinguish between a kind of logical or counterfactual dependence versus a kind of metaphysical or explanatory dependence. So a logical or counterfactual dependence is something like. Um, it would not exist were it not for something else existing. Um, and so there really isn't a sort of causal or non-causal explanatory oomph going on there. Um, it would instead just be assigned a, it, be a kind of dependence where um, the thing in question would not exist were it not for the other thing to exist. So it's kind of logical or counterfactual. Uh, on the other hand, an explanatory metaphysical dependence would be like 
uh, God or the being in question would be perhaps grounded in or some aspect of that thing's being is explained by um, this other thing. And so uh, some non-classical theists will argue that um, instead there's only a logical or counterfactual dependence between God and perhaps God's various properties, say, um, instead of a kind of metaphysical or explanatory dependence. So that's one line of response. A second line of response, someone might adopt maybe priority monism, according to which God grounds God's parts. So the whole is in some sense prior to the parts. So you can check out Matthew Badorf's 2016 paper for that. Uh, and again, I'm just giving brief outlines. So the third one that someone might respond is that um, this does seem to be maybe perhaps a too demanding account of a Sadie, because one might think that Trinitarianism has at least some kind of uh, intrinsic multiplicity in God, um, and whatever that multiplicity is, it would be something without which God would not exist, and in some sense explains God's character qua Trinitarian. And so one might think that um, under such an understanding of a Sadie, um, this sort of strong demand, Trinitarianism might not be compatible with divine aseity. And then the fourth response that someone might give is just uh, to adopt an alternative conception of aseity, like to say that God depends on nothing that is outside of God. And so you allow a sort of intrinsic differentiation, whatever kind. Um, so those are just brief responses. I'm not going to defend them or, or sort of outline them further. Um, and yeah. Um, maybe, uh, Christopher, do you want to just go on to maybe uh, briefly doing the natural theology and stuff? Because we might, we might want to start getting to the objection sometime soon. Yeah, let me, uh, let, I'll do that. Let me just say something about counterfactual dependence and priority monism, which is, first of all, about counterfactual dependence. I think that's, that's quite right. Like, it, wouldn't do, it clearly wouldn't suffice to point out that, you know, well, if God's, you know, essential parts were not to exist, then God wouldn't exist. Because that's true of everything that has essential parts. Um, that that's not a very interesting um, kind of dependence. Um, it, it's it, it's just logical. It's not metaphysical or explanatory. We're we're really interested in whether God would metaphysically depend on, or uh, to use uh, philosophical jargon, be grounded by his parts. That's what we're really worried about. With respect to the kind of priority monism. Um, I think it, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's nothing prima facie implausible about God grounding God's parts if he has some. Um, I think that the traditional worry has not been that uh, God's parts ground God, but rather that the unity of God's parts grounds God. Um, it grounds God. Um, so it, it's, it's not that, uh, you know, we're, we're worried that there would be this part over here and this part over here and those parts, uh, you know, are grounding God, but rather the fact that it is rather the fact of their being united grounds God, because that's what makes it be the case that there's this one, one thing, God. Um, and it, and it seems to me at least, uh, that God can't ground the unity of his parts. He can ground his parts perhaps, but he can't ground the fact that they're united. And I think that's, that, that at least would be the traditional, um, what way I think that the argument from aseity to simplicity would proceed. Um, but assuming you don't want to say anything in response to that, Joe, I'll, I'll move on to natural theology. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine with me. We can, we can proceed. Okay. So, yeah, so uh, another motivation for divine simplicity is that a lot of the classical theistic arguments, um, such as Aquinas' first way or a Neoplatonic argument from composition or Aquinas' De Ante argument um, really kind of set the stage for divine simplicity in a certain way, right? The, the way in which they prove that God exists, uh, what, what gets proven to exist at the end of these arguments is something that uh, ultimately has to end up being uh, simple. So, for example, in, with respect to Aquinas' first way, Right, the argument is everything. Uh, you know, some things are in motion. Everything that's in motion is put in motion by another. There can't be an infinite regress of movers. Therefore, there's some immovable mover. And of course, when Aquinas says talks about motion, he's talking about the actualization of potentialities, right? Um, and so, what he means by an immovable mover, uh, an immovable mover, is something that's purely actual. And then he uses this fact of God's pure actuality to argue in the very next question that God must be simple in all these various ways, uh, right? Um, precisely because th this is where it connects up with the 
um, thing I noted earlier, which is that the the various kinds of parts that we discussed, uh, at least to the Aristotelian or, or Thomist, um, are comp compositions of act and potency, right? There's there's some kind of potency there and some kind of act there. And um, if we find out at the end of the first way that the thing that gets labeled God um, is something that's purely actual, then it's really just a very short step from there to um, the exclusion of um, the exclusion of composition in God of the sort that posits potentiality in him. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I did before just moving on to some other things, I did just want to flag that, um, of course, many like theists and non theists alike object to such arguments, including um, I've got a number of papers under review and one that's actually forthcoming in the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion that sort of touches on uh, Aristotelian kinds of arguments from change, things like that. Um, but we don't need to sort of explore that here. I just kind of want to flag them so people understand uh, things like, you know, uh, surrounding the debates here. Um, and so then right. I guess we can move on. Um, other arguments uh, for divine simplicity might take their lead from scripture. Um, and again, I'll just point people to the discussion between Stephen Nemesh and Ryan Mullins on capturing Christianity. They talked about scriptural passages. And then finally, there are various other, you know, maybe motivations. One might think that it kind of preserves monotheism or preserves transcendence, or one might, you know, argue from Mariology and Trinitarianism um, that Christopher's kind of developed and elsewhere. Um, but yeah, that's sort of just a brief outline. And so maybe we can, um, if we're if we're cool with it, maybe going on to a sampling of, of problems for divine simplicity, unless Cameron, you have any like questions for us or anything. Nope. Uh, I, I did want to mention that we are going to do some Q and a, so in about an hour from now, so we're going to, we're going to spend a good amount of time them dialoguing about some of these objections to divine simplicity. And then after that, we're going to take some questions from you. So don't put anything in the live chat yet. I'll let you know when we're getting close to that point, we're about to, to transition over to to Q and A, but that is going to happen. So if you have a question for either of my guests today, then just uh, hold on to it, and I'll let you know when. So that that's all that I have. Okay. Okay. Sweet. So now we're sort of moving into the the kinds of problems that one might level. And so I do have a. a, a some brief notes first. Um, I do want to say that this is, of course, an educational sampling. It's to inform, not really to defend or protect a tribe. It's also, uh, we're not claiming to be completely representative or comprehensive. Um, unfortunately, we had to wait, we had to, like narrow this down a lot, which was kind of sad. But um, yeah, so those are the main, uh, main sorts of things. I mean, if you want to explore some of this deeper, you can check on various videos on my channel and so on. Um, but yeah, um, so maybe we can go into... Um, the the first the first one which is kind of identification of supposit or individual and let essence me, or nature so, oh yeah sorry go on, that's fine let me i just yeah just um i i, I just want to right uh emphasize there uh, yeah along with you that there's lots of different kinds of arguments that one could have about each kind of composition that you find in god so part of what we're trying to hopefully um show people is that there's not just like one debate about the doctrine of divine simplicity, right? The doctrine talks about a number of different kinds of composition and there's for each kind of composition, there's a number of arguments uh, that one would make for why God has to have that kind of composition or why he couldn't have that kind of composition. So um, part of what we're trying to do is show people that there's that this, you know, the, the debate around the doctrine of divine simplicity is actually a constellation of debates depending on exactly what kind of composition you're talking about. Um, and so hopefully people can, you know, um, use this video as a, 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 a taking off point for themselves to um, dive deeper into uh, the arguments for or against a particular kind of composition in God. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Definitely. No, that that's really good. And uh, we want this video to be, a, a, you know, like like he said, a jumping off point, sort of not, not to end the discussion, but really to start it. So uh, for the sake of time, Christopher, I think I'm just going to go to that second Trinitarian worry um, instead of the first one. Um, okay. If you're okay with that, just, you know, because we have lots of problems that we really want to get to. And so sure. um, I'll just outline the second Trinitarian worry that someone might, someone might level. So one might think that uh, an inconsistent tetrad or four different kind of theses or claims is at least a prima facie plausible problem for classical theism. And so here is that kind of tetrad. So number one, if God is Trinitarian, then there is at least some positive ontological item or other intrinsic to, but distinct from God. 
Now, one might think, for instance, that these would be the eternal processions that relate the persons of the Trinity, right? So um, the Father begets the Son, and together the Father and the Son spirate, uh, or like generate the Spirit. And so these things are sort of asymmetric relations of perhaps some kind of dependence. Um, and so one might think that this, uh, these are positive ontological items, that is to say something with some kind of reality that is within God, but that is strictly speaking not identical to God. Um, and then the second one would be God is Trinitarian. That's the second claim. Um, but we would then move on to our third claim, which would be that if classical theism is true, then there is no positive ontological item intrinsic to, but distinct from God, right? That's what we sort of outlined earlier with our understanding of parts. Uh, and then the fourth claim would be classical theism is true. And so all these four, if you look at it on the document, they sort of create a, an inconsistent tetrad. And so it's difficult to see which of these you'd reject, so the argument goes, except for number four, uh, classical theism is true. So that's kind of the argument. Um, and now we can, uh, you know, we'll just go back and forth for a little bit on this, and I'll turn it over to Christopher. Sure. So I'm going to reject one. Um, and let me preface my rejection of one by saying that there are certainly models of the Trinity that are inconsistent with the doctrine of divine simplicity. Um, so especially the, the so-called social Trinitarian models um, that uh, have been popular in, in, the, uh, in the contemporary literature. Um, if you think, for example, that the, the persons, the divine persons are um, parts of God and that God is the community of the three persons, that is plainly inconsistent with the doctrine of divine simplicity. There's no way to, to square those. Um, so I think um, you really do need a model of the Trinity um, that does not view God as a community or uh, in, a, in this social Trinitarian way. Uh, you need a more Latin model of the Trinity on which you know, each person is identical to uh, the divine nature, um, but distinct from each other. Um, and, uh, I think there are reasons that we, you know, I won't get into right now, um, why this is Christian orthodoxy according to the first seven ecumenical councils anyway. Um, but it, uh, if one doesn't believe that, um, then it's certainly true at least that you can't have a social tr a Trinitarian model and the doctrine of divine simplicity you need to choose. Um, but uh, I think once we reject a social Trinitarian model or any model on which we view the divine persons as parts of God, um, then I think uh, the problem starts to dissolve. Um, there's still a problem. There's still a mystery of the Trinity that's not going to go away for anybody. Um, but I think the apparent tension between Trinitarianism and the doctrine of divine simplicity at least starts to go away. So that's why I'm going to reject one. Right? I'm not going to say that the um, that the persons are actually distinct from uh, the processions between them or the relations between them. So I think, for example, God the Father is his paternity, um, uh, and you know the Son is uh, his procession from the Father, and the Spirit is his procession from the Father and the Son, and so forth. And all those things are in turn identical to the divine nature itself. Um, so then you might ask me, well, okay, that might get you out of that problem, Christopher, but um, so then how exactly are you distinguishing the persons from each other? Um, and that's where uh, the persons being identical to relations really becomes uh, important. And let me just head one issue off at, at, at the beginning here. When I say that the persons are relations, some people might think, well, that doesn't really sound very personal. Um, well, it's true. Uh, it if the persons were just relations, that would be some kind of a problem. But remember, the relations uh, I'm identifying here with the divine nature itself. And the divine nature has will, it has intellect, um, it loves, it, you know, right, it, do, it does all these things, it, it has all these powers. Um, and so that, that, that is personal. But what I'm saying is there's, they are also relations. Um, and the relations that they bear to each other, to which they're identical, distinguish them from each other but not from the divine essence, right? So um, God the Father is the divine essence, um, and he's related in a certain way uh, to the Son, such that the mutual opposition, that, that opposition that is part of the nature of a relation, distinguishes him from the Son, 
but neither the Father nor the Son are distinguished from the divine essence, um, because there's no opposition between the Father and the divine essence, whereas there is opposition between the Father and the Son. Um, I'll let Joe respond. Well, I, I wanted to yeah, point so, out real quick that Joe's, Joe's had a, a discussion that he hosted on his channel between Rob Coons and Ryan Mullins on this particular mm -hmm. topic. So if this interests you, I wanted to point you to his his dialogue. He's he's trying to be like a mini capturing Christianity is what, what Joe's trying to do. Let's just, mm -hmm. let's just be honest. No, but I he, he hosted a great dialogue. And uh, so if you're interested in this, then I would highly recommend checking out that that dialogue uh also i wanted to ask you a question chris couldn't you just say and then joe don't i hope i hope this doesn't make you lose your train of thought so just ignore what i'm about to say so chris couldn't you use a similar move that you used earlier in the case of the trinity and that in there's something like a trinity in god well um no and here's why so um i mean the trinity is a purely theological concept. So when I talk about analogy, when I say something like, well, there's something like creaturely power in God. Um, what I mean by that is, right, there, there's, in God, there's something that has effects that are something like what we find to be the effects of creaturely power. Um, and so I see, I see the similar effects, like I do things and it has effects, and God does things and it has effects. Um, and so there's some kind of similarity there, right? Um, but the similarity can't be total, right? God does things that have, have effects ex, ex nihilo. I don't do that, right? So there's a big difference. Um, but uh, there is a similarity. With the Trinity, there's no kind of creaturely strict, you know, no strict creaturely analogy to be had. Of course, you do find in Augustine and, and other um, fathers of the church and so on, um, illustrations, if you will, of, of, of the Trinity as found in creatures. So, you know, talk about the, the, the mind, the, the will, and the, and the person, um, sorry, the, the, sorry, the mind, the will, and the intellect, um, or the imagination, um, are something like the persons of the Trinity, um, or uh, the, the sun, its rays and its heat, or something like the Trinity. But I think these are really more like illustrations than analogies. Um, that's why people who use them so often get accused of various Trinitarian heresies, uh, like modalism and so on. So, you know, the Trinity is something we want to say is only about God. Uh, there is no creaturely analog to be found, strictly speaking. There's just... Um, traces or illustrations that one might give to try to jog someone's intuitions about why it's not incoherent, but that's the best you get. There's no analogy, so I don't want to. No, I I don't want to say there's something like a Trinity in God. I want to say there is a Trinity in God, um, and it's the only Trinity that we speak of. All right, Jeff. yeah. Um, so because this is sort of like an educational sampling, I'm not going to go back and forth much. I'll just offer one way that um, the non-classical theist might respond or, or someone might respond. Um, so one way is just to say, well, like, hold on a second. Um, we, might, we might think that the sun is generated or begotten. But God as such doesn't seem to be generated or begotten. That seems to be an asymmetric relation. Um, and it is sort of part of conciliar um, Trinitarianism that these relations are asymmetric. Um, so if God is not begotten uh, at extra, but the Son is begotten, it seems as though we have some kind of strict distinction between the Son and God as such. Uh, the Godhead, maybe we can say. Um, but if that's the case, then because the Son is not extrinsic to God, it would be intrinsic to God, but not, strictly speaking, identical to the Godhead. Um, and hence, per the understanding of parts that we outlined earlier, one might argue that this would constitute composition. Um, and so I'll let Christopher have the last word on that. That's fine with me. And we can move on to, uh, after Christopher gets in the last word, we can move on to the the next the next argument in this. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if there's too much I can say in response to that that uh, that would be brief. Um, I, I mean, I, I think this is where the you, you got to get really into the nitty gritty of the metaphysics of relations. Um, so, I mean, what I want to say, like what I want to say about the son's begottenness, right, is that the son is his begottenness, um, and it in in a begottenness is a way of talking about the son's 
insofar as he's related to the Father. Um, insofar as he just is the divine essence, that's an, that's not a relational thing. Um, that's just an absolute identity thing. Um, and so uh, you get that, you know, God qua divine essence is not begotten, um, but uh, there is a relation in the in the divine essence between the father and the son and the direct the directedness right the what gets called by the scholastics essay odd being toward of the relation is the son's begottenness but that towardness is not the it's not that's not what the essence is right that's not and it's not uh, an additional positive ontological item it's just something that comes along for free when the positive ontological item in question is a relation is that there's this directedness toward something else. Yeah, the, the, I, I mean, there's a lot to say in response, but again, I, I, I'm not going sure. to pursue this further for sake of time. So um, I think we can go on to the, the sort of subject and accidents identification, um, or not identification, but banning, as it were, from uh, divine simplicity. So uh, the first, um, well, I guess one of the, I, I don't know if it's the first, but the, one of the central arguments that we're going to explore here is what's uh, called the aloneness argument. So the background for this is um, classical theism is committed to a thesis called aloneness, we can just call it that, which says that possibly God exists alone. That is to say, possibly God exists without any non-God thing existing whatsoever. The, in other words, in contemporary analytics speak, there is some possible world wherein only God exists. And this follows from two central claims of classical theism. Number one, things only have being insofar as God's created, insofar as God creatively bestows being to them. And number two, God is free to creatively bestow said being or not, right? If God's free not to do it, then it's possible that he, does, that he doesn't do it. And if there being anything extrinsic to God presupposes that God does it, well, then it's possible that God exists alone. So that's really the, the, the sort of background commitment. Um, and so I guess a simple aloneness argument, before we get into a sort of uh, much more complex one, but a simple one for heuristic purposes, would say something like, premise one, if classical theism is true, then there cannot be a contingent, positive, ontological item within or intrinsic to God. Premise two, but there can be a contingent uh, item intrinsic to God. And so premise three, or conclusion, so classical theism is false. And so... For premise one, again, this is kind of just like a core commitment of classical theism, right? There can't be sort of contingent items intrinsic to God, because those would be accidents, and classical theism says God cannot have accidents. And so then premise two, there can be, remember what that says, it says there can be a contingent positive ontological item within God. Basically, we just say, okay, well, let's zoom in on the alone world, okay? Now, in that world wherein God chooses not to create, uh, we, would, we would think that any positive ontological item in that world is intrinsic to God. Uh, by definition, there is literally nothing apart from God in such a world, and hence there is literally no positive ontological item extrinsic to God in such a world. And so, what follows is that any positive ontological item in the world, in the alone world, is within, or is intrinsic to God. Or put differently, God couldn't have extrinsic features in the alone world, or extrinsic items, since there is quite literally nothing extrinsic or external to God in such a world to which God could relationally stand. So that's kind of, that's we might motivate that. And then the next step would say something like, in a world wherein God chooses not to create, God contingently has some knowledge. And this means that God contingently has some kind of positive ontological item, like uh, contingent knowledge, for instance. Um, Proust, uh, 2018, Chapter 8, and Grant uh, William Matthews Grant, 2012, they both explicitly grant this latter point that um, that God has that God contingently has some knowledge, and this is precisely why they opt for a kind of extrinsic model of divine knowledge. But what the alone world does is like is going to say, hold on, you can't have extrinsicality in the alone world because any positive ontological item is intrinsic to God in the alone world, um, and because God is omniscient, right? God knows all truths, and so because there are contingent truths in the alone world, right, wherein God chooses not to create, such contingent truths, an example would be God chooses not to create or Earth doesn't exist, right? It would follow that God only contingently has some knowledge in such a world. Um, and so from that, uh, we get that God uh, can have a contingent intrinsic item uh, because we, we got first that God could have existed alone, uh, and then any knowledge in such a world is intrinsic to God, again, because there aren't extrinsic positive ontological items. And from the previous step, we saw that such knowledge is, or some such knowledge is only contingently had by God. And so God could have something that is both contingent 
and intrinsic. And so God can have a contingent intrinsic feature or positive ontological item or whatever. Now, that's that's all by way of just sort of maybe briefly articulating it. There is a premise that that is in the longer version that Christopher wants to reject. And so I'll just give the longer version for you guys here. I'll do it briefly. And I won't motivate the premises further because that's what I just did earlier. So it says premise one, God's knowledge is either wholly intrinsic to God, wholly extrinsic to God, or intrinsic to God in some respects, but extrinsic to God in others. Premise two, but God's knowledge is wholly extrinsic to God or intrinsic to God in some respects, but extrinsic in others, only if God doesn't exist alone. And then premise three, possibly God exists alone. And from those, it follows that possibly God's knowledge is wholly intrinsic. Um, but premise five, necessarily God contingently has some knowledge or other. And so it follows that possibly God contingently has wholly intrinsic knowledge. But whatever is wholly intrinsic to S is either an essential feature of S or an accident of S. And of course, nothing God contingently has can be an essential feature of God. And so it follows that possibly God has an accident, which is incompatible with DDS or Doctrine of Divine Simplicity. So I'll turn it over to Christopher. I know he has a, a premise that he likes to re he would like to reject. So I'll turn it over to you, Christopher. Okay, Good. let's get so, clear real, real quick before you come in, Chris. Uh, some people were noticing or noting in the, the live chat that this one was a little bit difficult to follow. So is there a way that you can break this down a little bit further, Joe, for people? Like, can you give a summary of what the argument is, a quick, easy yeah, way to understand yeah. it? And I, I want to re re reiterate one more time, that if you're watching this live and you're just joining us, there's a description or there's a discussion brief linked in the description of this video that you can open up and it's actually got this argument listed out step by step. And so for me, I've got it pulled up over here on my screen so I can actually see what's happening. And it's, it's really helpful to me. So I imagine it's also going to be helpful to you. And so as you're watching this, definitely take advantage of that, pull it up. But yeah, so Joe, give me like a quick, easy to understand yeah. summary of what you just said. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's just assume the classical theism is true, right? Which means that there is a possible world where God exists alone without anything else existing. Mm -hmm. um, why is that the case? Well, because God is free to create and under classical theism, there being anything apart from God, already kind of presupposes that God created. So if God's free to create or not, well, then there's some possible world, right, wherein God just exists alone because he chose not to create, right? So we can call this the alone world. It's just a world where only God exists. God's just there. He's chilling. He's basking in his glory. He's just like, look at me. I'm so awesome. I'm so cool. Be jealous. So, so that, that's simple. what God's like in the alone world. <laughs> okay, so he, this is the alone world. Okay, now, any sort of thing that has reality in this world any kind of positive ontological item, any feature, we can say, something that has being, whatever that is, that's going to have to be intrinsic to God. Why is that? Well, because there is nothing extrinsic to God in such a world, right? Anything extrinsic to God requires God to create it, right? Which means that if God doesn't create in this world, if he exists alone, there's nothing extrinsic to God. And so whatever has being in this world, whatever is a sort of positive ontological item, it's going to be intrinsic to God. It's going to be within God. But here's the rub. God contingently has some knowledge in this world. And what that means is that there's some kind of reality, God's knowledge, that's only contingently obtaining. Uh, because, precisely because, uh, the truths that God knows in such a world are contingent, right? You can't necessarily know something that is true, because uh, that would entail that the thing known is necessary. That's so knowledge presupposes truth, so if you necessarily know something, then the thing known is, is necessary. But there are contingent truths in the alone world, right? God freely chose not, not to create. That's a contingent truth, and God's going to know that, and God's going to contingently know that. And again, Proust and William Matthews Grant agree that God contingently has um, knowledge or, or what have you. So what, when we put these together, right, we see that there is nothing extrinsic to God in the alone world. So whatever is in the alone world, whatever has some kind of being or reality, is going to be intrinsic to God. But we just found earlier that there's some sort of contingently obtaining reality, namely God's contingent knowledge. So what follows is that there's some kind of contingent reality within God. And that's not compatible with classical theism. According to classical yeah. theism, whatever is in God is necessarily had. It, he doesn't have any accidents that are sort of contingent intrinsic items within him. So hopefully that's a good summary. Yeah, yeah, that is. And so I think if I can anticipate how Chris is going to respond to this, it seems like it's going to be along the same lines of what we talked about earlier where when we're thinking about knowledge, we can't just, what, how did you put it? We, from the, you know, we can't look at our knowledge and suppose that that's like 
how God's knowledge operates. Can't can't say that that connection is exactly the same. It's not univocal. There you go. So is that is that how you're going to respond here? That's part of it. Um, I think there's something more fundamental going on here, though. So I, I want to begin by noting that, um, you know, Joe's done some um, important work here uh, in coming up with this argument. I think this is the, the best, um, you know, modal collapse kind of argument that I've seen. Um, and so I want to thank him for, uh, you know, presenting this. Um, now, with that said, as um, well, let me and let me just add, I guess, a note of further explanation about where the arguments kind of coming from. So I think th this may or may not track the uh, exact way in which Joe came up with the argument. But here's how I would have came up with this argument if I were thinking this way. So prior to like thinking about the alone world, right, you might just think, well, look, divine simplicity entails divine immutability. And immutability means God never changes. But God knows things. Um, and it some of the things that God knows change, changes, right? Uh, I was once a boy, now I'm a man. Uh, when I was a boy, God knew that I was a boy. Now he knows that I'm a man. Um, and, you know, lots of other changes in the world. God knows about all these changes. So uh, God's knowing about the changes that are going on in the world looks like it's incompatible with immutability, and if we don't have immutability, uh, we don't have simplicity because simplicity entails immutability. OK, so the way in which the classical tradition has responded to this, right, is is to say that divine knowledge um, has an e extrinsic element. Um, now, I think this is actually true of creaturely knowledge for a reason uh, as well, for a reason that I'll explain in a moment. But, you know, when we say that God knows something um, that God knows that I'm a, I'm a man rather than a boy, um, that, this can, that this difference in God's knowledge consists simply in the fact that I am a man rather than a boy, that, and, it, and in the fact that God is the, is the cause of me as a man. Uh, uh, and back when he knew that I was a boy, he was the cause of me as a boy. This is why in the classical tradition it's common to see um, classical, uh, classical theists say that it, God's knowledge is the cause of things, right? So human beings, we look out on the world and we find out how it is and we try to conform our intellects to how the world is out there, okay? It's important to remember that with God, it goes the other way around. God does not look out on the world, at least not in the classical tradition. He does not look out on the world to find out what it's like and conform his beliefs, conform his intellect to what the world is like. Rather, right, he already knows what he wants to create, and he makes the world conform to that plan, to his beliefs, to his knowledge, right? Um, so uh, it go, there's a directionality of fit to knowledge, right? And it goes in the opposite direction, depending on if you're talking about um, creaturely knowledge or divine knowledge. For creaturely knowledge, the direction of fit is intellect to world. For God, the direction of fit is world to intellect, right? Um, uh, because God is the source of all the creatures, and he creates them according to how he knows he wants them to be. Okay, um, so that's the, that's the important bit. So then I think what Joe is at it, right, is to say, well, look, that, that, um, that view might get you away from the, the very simple problem of, um, God's knowledge of changing things in the world. But let's think about the world where God exists all by himself. And in that world, it looks like God still knows some things, including some things that are contingent, such as that in that world, there are no dogs. Um, there could have been dogs. So it's contingent that there are no dogs. And yet God knows that there are no dogs. Um, and Joe wants to say, right, that that knowledge is, has to be intrinsic to God. It, you, can't, you can't use the extrinsic model of divine knowledge here precisely because in the alone world, there's nothing extrinsic to God, right? We, that's what we said. You know, he's, he exists alone. And it is, of course, a commitment of classical theism that God could have been alone. God could have um, just not created at all. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, now I did actually want to draw everybody's attention to the extended form of this argument, the one with uh, 11 propositions there, um, because I want to focus in on two and explain why I think two is false, and therefore the argument is unsound. Um, so um, two is false because it presupposes a certain... Um, analysis of intrinsicality that I think has been definitively shown to be false in 20th century contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, namely, that if God exists alone, he can't have any extrinsic properties. And that's a crucial premise that I think Joe needs. In fact, I think that's the crux of his whole ar argument. And I think um, it can be demonstrated to be false. So here's a counterexample. The property of being lonely, right? So in addition to all the contingent knowledge that God um, has in the alone world, he also has the property of being alone. He's all by himself in that world. Um, and yet his uh, aloneness or his loneliness, however you, uh, obviously loneliness has negative psychological connotations that I don't want here. Um, so maybe it's better to just talk about aloneness. His aloneness is not intrinsic to him. Here's why. We could uh, deprive God of his aloneness without changing anything about God. Okay? How? Well, we could just have something else co come into existence in the world. Of course, God would have to cause that himself. But um, uh, if he did that, right, then something about the world uh, that's totally extrinsic to him would change. Namely, some other thing would come into existence, such as dogs perhaps right and yet um uh, he would thereby lose the property of being alone he would no longer be alone and so uh aloneness is an example of a property that god can have in the alone world but which nevertheless is extrinsic because you can deprive god of it without um uh without changing anything intrinsic to god and so the property is extrinsic uh, if you can change, if you can give it to the subject or deprive the subject of it without um, changing anything about the subject, that is a clear uh, indication that the property is extrinsic. And that's true of aloneness. So, um, and that, that's sufficient, I think, to defeat premise two. Um, but I'll say, I'll say more, um, right? Because I, I, I've given an example of a property that is, can be had by God in the alone world and which is nevertheless extrinsic, and so two is false. Um, however, uh, I do want to say something about knowledge. And uh, right, what I just said about loneliness, uh, that's not me really speaking. That's um, uh, David Lewis, one of the you know titans of contemporary analytic philosophy speaking. Um, uh, I will refer your viewers to his work on intrinsicality, um, where he, you know, uh, talks about this loneliness test. He attributes it to, to Jang Wan Kim. Um, and uh, it's well understood, I think, in the literature that this is a bad test for intrinsicality uh, because of the counterexample I just mentioned. Um, now, Joe is particularly concerned about knowledge, however, and I think that um, not only uh, is God's knowledge extrinsic and that's not a problem with him having extrinsic knowledge in the alone world. But you can also see that uh, human knowledge is, is extrinsic and that indeed human knowledge uh, in the alone, in, in the world where a human being exists alone would also still be extrinsic. So um, let's step back from God for a moment, right? And just think about if I were to exist in a world alone, right? There's no God, nothing else uh, contingent. It's just me. Of course, you know, on the classical model, this is impossible, but um, it still illustrates the, the point. Um, suppose, per impossible, that I did exist in the alone world, and that I knew that um, in this world, there are no dogs. It's just me, right? Now, um, you might think that my knowledge is intrinsic to me, um, but that would be wrong. And here's why. Uh, part of knowledge is truth. Um, it, this is in epistemology called the factivity of knowledge, right? Um, it, in, it, it entails truth. If you, you can't know something that's false. Okay. 
So I am in the alone world all by myself. In that alone world, I know that um, there are no dogs. And yet my knowledge that there are no dogs is not intrinsic to me. Um, because if dogs came into existence, something that has nothing to do with me, that doesn't change me intrinsically in any way, um, I would, it would cease to be true that there are no dogs, and therefore I would cease to know that there are no dogs. Um, so even with respect to creaturely knowledge, I think two things are true. Namely, one, that um, knowledge is extrinsic uh, because knowledge depends on truth, and truth is extrinsic. There's just no getting around that. So I think um, we shouldn't be so... We shouldn't think it's so weird to hear that divine knowledge is extrinsic because all knowledge is extrinsic because it all entails truth. Uh, and number two, um, uh, the problem here about divine knowledge is not special about special to divine knowledge, right? It, you could just as well have a creature whose knowledge, uh, who exists in the alone world all by itself, and yet whose knowledge is extrinsic to him because it depends on truth, and truth is extrinsic. I'll let Joe respond. So, Joe, before yeah, I mean, you come I in, I, I want to do this. So, I want to try to see if we can move on to a new objection pretty soon. Sure. Are you Are you guys open yeah. to that? Yeah, I mean, sure. maybe I can get in the last. I mean, I know. Yeah. I what I was going to suggest. Word, but I mean, what I was going to suggest, Joe, is that you give the last word on this one and then move to a new one, because yeah, Chris yeah, took up a substantial amount of time. Okay. Mm, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing that I do want to say is that. Um, First, for the audience, just note that my argument does not require that there are no extrinsic components of knowledge. I mean, of course, um, truth, if, it, if it's correspondence with reality or extramental reality, then any knowledge of extramental reality is going to have to require some sort of extrinsic component. So I do want the audience to know that my argument does not hinge on saying that knowledge as such is thoroughly intrinsic or completely intrinsic. Um, it's perfectly compatible with there being some extrinsic element. The second thing that I want to say is that um, I don't see the property of aloneness as a counterexample to premise two, because I know you talked about knowledge in your second objection, but my premise two doesn't talk about properties. It specifically focuses on knowledge, not about properties like the property of aloneness or things like that. I would actually argue that aloneness, uh, the property of being alone is not a property. That's that's what I would argue because it's a sort of, it's a, it's a negative existential. It's uh, this does not exist and that does not exist and that does not exist and that does not exist and the thing in question exists. We're God, for say. Um, so I don't think that it's a, it's a property corresponding to any sort of um, attribute that something has. And so I would deny that as a, as a counterexample. Um, the next thing that I would say is that, um, once again, uh, my premise talks about a mixture of intrinsic knowledge, uh, intrinsic to God in some respects, but extrinsic in others. So um, even if the truth to which God's knowledge corresponds um, is extrinsic, there's still, I would argue that there's still going to be uh, an intrinsic component to it, which is going to be contingently had by God. And so that that, that gets to my um, intrinsic to God in some respects, but ex extrinsic to God in others. That gets to that little proviso or proviso or however it's pronounced. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say was... Um, I think that truth, if something is true, then it's going to presuppose some sort of correlate within reality uh, that makes it true. Um, you know, truth presupposes in some sense some kind of being. Um, and so if it's a contingent truth that doesn't report a negative existential, I would argue that that is going to be um, presupposing some sort of um, some sort of element in being, some sort of uh, concrete reality or some sort of reality uh, that, that accounts for the truth. Um, so uh, what that would mean is that if there is a, um, a contingent truth in the alone world, which is not, um, which is not strictly speaking uh, one about negative existentials, like God exists alone and there does, does not exist other things, but is instead about some positive reality, a positive reality like God's knowledge of something, or uh, God knows that he chose, not to be alone, right? Um, I think these are going to be sort of positive, positive um, predications. And so, uh, in my estimation, I think positive predications, uh, if they're going to be true by the correspondence theory of truth, they're going to have to correspond with some feature of reality. And because they're contingently true, I think it has to correspond with some contingent feature of reality. Okay, uh, that's I'm done. Sorry for taking up like three minutes for that, but um, I know Christopher will will definitely have things to say. And you know, maybe we can go back and forth on this on Facebook with each other, private messages. That'll be fun. Um, but yeah, I think I do think we can we can move on. Um, so um, the essence and existence one, people can read that. Um, I don't think we're going to get into that. I think we can get into the act potency one. So for the changing knowledge of a, of a changing creation. And maybe maybe this will be 
maybe we'll just have to sort of end out with this one because this one might take a, a little while, but because uh, we're going to get into extrinsic knowledge. So let me sort of lay out, do some unpacking for this. You know, it, it might take a little while to do some of the unpacking because, you know, I'm doing background of time and change and succession and eternity, um, a lot of things. So, you know, just sit back for like seven-ish minutes or like something like that. Um, and just I'll, I'll give my presentation of the background and defense of the premises. And then I'll turn it over to Christopher. So this argument says that premise one, uh, if there is no potential in God, then God cannot acquire new knowledge and lose old knowledge. Premise two, God can acquire new knowledge and lose old knowledge. And so premise three, there is potential in God. And of course, if true, that would entail the falsity of classical theism. So what might we say on behalf of the premises? Well, premise one, it says, again, if there's no potential in God, then God cannot acquire new knowledge and lose old knowledge. I would argue that this is very explicitly affirmed by classical theistic thinkers, both new and old. Now, many, if not many, but not all of these scholarly references that I'm going to be getting into here are discussed at length in Dr. Ryan Mullins' 2016 book uh, published uh, The End of the Timeless God with Oxford University Press. So um, the first preliminary is uh, that the classical theistic under understanding uh, has really affirmed a, what's called a relational theory of time, uh, on which time exists if and only if change exists. And this idea can be found in, you know, standard medieval theology textbook by Peter Lombard. Uh, he writes, quote, but to change through time is to become different according to the interior or exterior qualities which are in the thing that is changed, end quote. Now let's move on to timelessness. So timelessness just means that God exists without beginning, without end, uh, without succession, and without temporal location or extension. Um, now, it's important to understand timelessness uh, within the classical theistic tradition as well. So, in the Trinity is one God, not three gods, Boethius says, quote, the expression, God is ever, denotes a single present, summing up his continual presence in all the past, in all the present, and in all the future, uh, unquote. Now, here and elsewhere, Boethius is pretty explicit that all of time is eternally present to God. Anything that God ever possesses is possessed by God in a single, superabundant, timeless present, or now. This leaves no room for God's transitioning from knowing P to not knowing P, or vice versa, because again, God's whole life, everything God possesses, is possessed by God in a single, superabundant, timeless moment with no succession whatsoever. Um, so let's move on to what some scholars have had to say by in, in defense of this uh, first premise. Um, Dr. Paul Helm writes, quote, an individual is immutable for the strong immutability sense required by divine simplicity. If no temporal or spatial changes apply to that thing, not even temporal or spatial merely Cambridge changes. A real temporal change occurs when the duration of an object is extended, just as a real spatial change occurs when an object comes into fresh spatial locations with other things. The creator is immutable to the extent that he does not even have merely Cambridge temporal and spatial relations with any other substances, much less real changes, unquote. Dr. Ed Fazer says, quote, God would constantly be acquiring new pieces of knowledge, such as the knowledge that it is now time T1, the knowledge that it is now time T2, and so forth. But all of this would involve change, and God is immutable, end quote. And so he goes on to explicitly deny that immutability um, could, uh, could be had while God is acquiring new knowledge, like it is now time T1 and now time T2. So that's Ed Fazer. Uh, also, uh, William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland, quote, Di divine timelessness or divine simplicity would require that God undergo neither in intrinsic nor extrinsic change, for in either case, a relation of before and after would be generated by such changes, which would serve to locate God temporally with respect to those changes. Thus, God would have to be incapable of even the slightest alteration, unquote. That's in their Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. There's also Dr. Tom uh, Thomas Williams. According to Thomas Williams, classical theism affirms that all of God's knowledge is self-knowledge. God knows things not by a quasi-perception, but rather by having a perfect comprehension of his own essence. And given divine simplicity, this knowledge is identical to God. That's found in his entry in the, the monolithic 1,000-page volume published by Springer, Models of God and Alternative Ultimate Realities. Um, you also see this affirmed in Augustine and in Aquinas in Summa Contra Gentiles, where he says, quote, primarily and essentially God knows only himself, end quote. Now, what's important to note here is that the classical theistic tradition is clear that the external world, things that happen in time, in no way cause God to have knowledge or account for God's having knowledge. God's knowledge is completely and utterly independent of what happens in time. And this commitment of CT entails premise one, CT is classical theism, uh, since if God knows only himself, then God cannot acquire any new knowledge or lose old knowledge, since God himself does not change, and hence God's knowledge of himself does not change either. Boethius also says, um, quote, God's knowledge, which passes over every change, views its own direct comprehension of everything as though it were taking place in the present, 
Now, this is explicitly claiming that God's knowledge cannot change at all, whether intrinsically or extrinsically, because he unchangingly and immutably possesses his knowledge in a single timeless instant. Augustine says, quote, God's mind does not pass from one thought to another. His vision is utterly unchangeable. He comprehends all that takes place in time, the future, past, and present, in an immutable and eternal present. His knowledge of what happens in time is completely independent of time and succession and change. Once again, this is an explicit commitment to premise one. Augustine says, um, uh, God does not see in time, nor does anything new happen in his sight or his knowledge. He's saying, nor does anything new happen in his knowledge when some temporal or transitory action is performed. So he's explicit that God does not acquire new knowledge or lose old knowledge. Dr. Ryan Mullins discusses several passages from Augustine and Lombard as well. Uh, they're kind of debating, or they're discussing in Augustine and Lombard, whether God's knowledge stays exactly the same uh, while the universe comes into existence. Now, they maintain that God's knowledge does stay exactly the same, because God is already immutable and timeless, and he knows all things immutably and timelessly. And this excludes the very idea of God's knowledge changing either intrinsically or extrinsically. Um, again, even an extrinsic change is still a change. Aquinas in De Veritate says God's knowledge does not change, but always remains the same. Um, and, you know, the, the, the passages go on from Sharnock and uh, Stephen Sharnock, Henry Moore, they t um, and James Dolezal, who is explicit that any change is foreign to God. Catherine Rogers, quote, in the classical theistic tradition of Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas, God is immutable. His essential knowledge, or his essential nature does not change. His will does not change. His knowledge does not change, unquote. So that's Catherine Rogers. Richard Gale says similar things. Um, Peter Lombard, Aquinas, talks about how anything that acquires anything new um, that constitutes a change, and he says this in no way belongs to God. Um, and he, uh, this is in question nine, article one of the Prima Pars of the Summa Theologiae. Um, he he's explicitly says that God cannot acquire anything new. That is a quote. Um, and so just to kind of take stock for the audience, I mean, we've gone through, uh, you know, the scholars that we've canvassed in this regard are one, um, Aquinas, Lombard, Boethius, Augustine, William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, Paul Helm, Ed Fazer, Thomas Williams, Kate Rogers, Ryan Mullins, Henry Moore, Richard Gale, James Dolezal, Stephen Sharnock. That's 15 scholars that are supporting premise one, both with regard to extrinsic and intrinsic change. Um, and then premise two, that God can acquire and lose knowledge. Um, I'll just be very brief here, and then I'll turn it over to Christopher. Sorry for being long, but <laughs> I'm, I'm really passionate about this problem. Um, so if there's real dynamism in reality, then since God is omniscient, God's knowledge will likewise be dynamic, right? Because knowledge presupposes truth, it follows that if the truth changes, knowledge of such truths change as well. And hence, it seems to me that premise two follows. Okay, so that's my long presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now and let Christopher respond. Okay, um, so let's see. Let me I remind the audience I, real quick of the, of the yeah. two premises in the, in the argument, and then you can kind of explain which one that you disagree with. So just as a reminder, premise one is if there is no potential in God, then God cannot acquire new knowledge and lose old knowledge. Premise two, God can acquire new knowledge and lose old knowledge. And then three, so there is potential in God, which from that it follows that divine simplicity is false. So which which of those two premises do you deny, Chris? Or do you deny both? Um, good. So I think there's an equivocation on knowledge between premise one and premise two. And depending on how you want to settle that equivocation, that will determine whether I want to reject one or reject two. Um, I guess my the way I'm going to read things, I'm probably going to want to reject one. But here's the, I mean, here's the issue, right? Um, so back when we started uh, getting clarity on what the doctrine of divine simplicity is, we said that there's a difference between predicables about God and real properties, something that uh, denotes something real and ontologically positive in God. Um, Right. Uh, so there's lots of things that we can say about God or say about anything, for that matter. It's not anything particular to God in this way. Right. That doesn't really say anything about that thing. It says something about that thing in relation to something else. So, for example, uh, it's true of me that, you know, I weigh about 175 pounds. And you might think that that's really predicating something real in me. And in a way it is. It's, it, it's partially predicating something real in me. But it's also just saying something about the Earth, namely how strong the gravitational field uh, uh, of the Earth is. Um, and it, but the important point is that when I say I weigh 175 pounds, that statement does not wear its reference to the Earth on its sleeve. Okay, um, 
you have to really think about what you're saying in order to understand that my weighing 175 pounds is not really just about me. It's about me in relation to something else. Okay. So, um, I think what's going on, I think what gives this kind of argument its force is if you read knowledge in one as predicating something real and ontologically positive in God, but then you read two, you read knowledge in premise two as just being a predicable about God, right? We, we can say of God that he knows things. Uh, and that way you could get both premises to be true, uh, it, it, but there's an equivocation, and so modus ponens doesn't go through there. Um, so now why, why would I want to say that in some cases knowledge is not just something real in God, but it has to do with the way that God relates to other things? Well, it comes back to the point that I made earlier, right, that, uh, well, part of knowledge for, for anything, whether we're talking about God or creatures, um, you know, this isn't something on which I have to appeal to the doctrine of analogy, I don't think. Um, uh, it involves uh, truth, and truth is always extrinsic, okay? So when we say something like, uh, well, God knows what time it is, or God knows this or that changing thing, um, we are saying about God that he has a certain intrinsic state, right? He has, he, he has an intellect, he has a mind, and there's something intrinsic, uh, there, there, there's an intrinsic feature there. Um, in fact, we can talk about that intrinsic feature. That intrinsic feature is the respect in which he knows, him, knows, his, knows himself as, as how he is in himself and as the cause of uh, created things. Um, but there's also the the further fact, right, that um, that 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 what he that his beliefs line up with the world. Let's put it that way, right? That his beliefs actually line up with the world, and that part is not just about him anymore. It's about the world, right? Okay. So um, what I want to say about divine knowledge, right, is that uh, if we're talking about knowledge as a um, real ontologically positive thing in God, that never changes. There's only one thing that God ever knows in that sense, and that's himself, okay? Um, however, if we're talking about knowledge in the sense that God is the cause of created things and therefore knows them in this analogous way, well, that depends on something more than God. That depends on how the world actually is, okay, outside of God. And so... Um, just as when I say I weigh 175 pounds, I'm not talking about just how I am. I'm talking about how I am in relation to the earth. When I say that God knows what time it is or God knows that um, I'm a man and not a, a boy anymore, or God knows that the dinosaurs are extinct, I'm not just talking about how God is intrinsically anymore. I'm talking about how creatures are in relation to him, right, in relation to his causal activity. Um, so... What I want to say, right, is uh, there is something, of course, intrinsic about God's knowledge, uh, because, you know, if knowledge were just completely extrinsic, then rocks could know, right? There, there, there is some intrinsic feature. You have to have a mind. You have to have an intellect, and having an intellect is, is intrinsic. Um, but there's also an extri extrinsic feature, namely the, the truth of what God knows, and um, that's extrinsic. And that extrinsicality is enough to account for the differences in what God knows, what kind of knowledge we can predicate about God without positing any difference in the real ontological positive stuff in God that's intrinsic to him. Right. So um, 30 years ago, God knew that I was a boy. Today, he knows that I'm a man. Those, both of those items of divine knowledge have an intrinsic feature. They both require that God have a mind and um, have something in his mind, so to speak, right? Um, but what I want to say is uh, the difference between God's knowing that I, was a, that I was a boy 30 years ago and a man today um, is accounted for entirely by just the fact that 30 years ago I was a boy and today I'm a man. Um, it's accounted for by the difference in, 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 the, in the truth of how the world is. Um, so, uh, right, I guess just to sum up, right, uh, um, you only get a problem here, as far as I can see, if you read knowledge in premise one as, um, as 
something that is entirely intrinsic to God. Um, and uh, if you read knowledge in premise two as uh, something that is partially extrinsic to God, but then you're equivocating on knowledge. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so much. That, that was really good. So, um, yeah, this is definitely how the dialectic plays out in the literature. Just for people who are like curious, it, de it definitely sort of focuses on extrinsic models of divine knowledge. Could knowledge be extrinsic? Like maybe what components of it? And so, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff filling out that story. So, um, I know we don't have much time. So, uh, the, what I want to say in, re in response to that is just perhaps a question. So, Christopher, what do you think um, God's knowledge... Okay, so let's, let's take dinosaurs. Okay, so God... Um, knows that dinosaurs are actual 65 million years ago. Okay, so God knows dinosaurs are actual, but now he doesn't know dinosaurs are actual because they're not actual. They, yeah, right. so dinosaurs are not actual. So God's knowledge in some sense changes. Okay, well, well, yeah. I'm just going to ask you, what do you think this, what do you think this, this uh, true predication consists in? Like, like, is it just, is it just God exists and has a mind and then dinosaurs went from being actual to not actual is that all it consists in or like what is it consistent because i you know i i actually kind of start to lose my grip uh of of what we're talking about when we really take this kind of uh, a lot of these extrinsic models of divine knowledge to their you know pushing them to their limits like it, it almost seems as though um, we're no longer talking about knowledge but i do want to just ask you that's my main question and then maybe we can go yeah. back and forth just for like five minutes um like what does this changing knowledge consist in in your in your view Sure, that's a that's a real good question. So, right, I mean, part of what I've been trying to push as we've been talking about the extrinsicality of God is that extrinsic knowledge is extrinsic for everything. Um, but you're right to point out that when we talk about the extrinsicality of divine knowledge, it's uh, in some sense more uh, extrinsic because, for example, although knowledge is extrinsic for me, um, my beliefs aren't right um at least plausibly so right uh, you know i have different beliefs that partially ground my knowledge right i i uh 30 years uh 30 years ago i believed i was a boy and today i no longer believe that and that's an intrinsic change in me so um it, we have more extrinsicality going on in god that's certainly true now to answer your question um right let's parse out three different let, let's parse out two different things we can ask what does God's knowledge 65 million years ago that dinosaurs are actual or exist presently consist in? That's one. Two, what does his knowledge that dinosaurs are extinct now consist in? And then three, what does the difference consist in? Okay. And so what I want to say uh, is the following, that um, for one and two, um, the, you know, God's knowledge 65 million years ago that dinosaurs exist now and his knowledge now that dinosaurs are extinct, um, those both consist in uh, something partially extrinsic to God and partially extrinsic to God, right? It's intrinsic to God insofar as uh, God has an intellect and got the, uh, his, what his intellect is the cause of the dinosaurs back when they existed. And it was also the cause of what made them go extinct, um, and so on. Right. right. So it's it's two things there that are intrinsic to God, right? Like, he, it's his knowledge, right, and the causal efficacy of his knowledge. It's because God knows that dinosaurs um, went extinct that they went extinct, right? Because that's how God causes things. And then you could ask the further question: Okay, yeah, but what about what about the difference between the two, right? We uh, what about the, uh, what, what exactly is the difference between uh, God's knowledge 65 million years ago that dinosaurs existed then and his knowledge that they're presently extinct? If I subtract, so to speak, the former fact from the latter fact, what am I left with? And there I do want to say that the difference between the two is entirely extrinsic. That's in, there's no intrinsic element in the difference between the two. Um, because that would be incompatible with immutability, Right. The, the difference between God's knowing 65 million years ago that dinosaurs exist and his knowing now that they don't uh, consists simply in the fact that 65 million years ago dinosaurs existed and today they don't. The difference, it consists in that. I want to be clear about that. Yeah, okay, well, I mean, we're at, we're at like... Um...
five my time five thirty, and I, I'm I'm fine with giving you the last word on that. And so maybe we can turn to Q and A if Cameron's down for that. I mean, I I do have like a lot to say on that, but you know that would take a while, and I'm fine with because I got the sure. la I got the last word last time, so I, I think it's fair yeah. that you get the last word this time. Sure. Joe, you're so nice. You're so nice, Joe. All right, here here we go. Let's do some Q and A. <laughs> uh, so it, we've already got a super chat that was sent in by Silge Fredo, so that's what we're going to cover right now. But if you guys would like to send in some questions, I'll be checking out the live chat. If you send them as super chats, helps us out, and it all, those will definitely be asked today. So here's the, the first question that we have from Silge Fredo. So thank you for sending this in. If classical theism is true, why would God ever be alone? I think this is a question for Joe. Or, or it could be for Chris. Either one. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, we could take we could take a skeptical theist route, or we could, you know, hypothesize some reasons. So, a skeptical theist route would be like, well, I mean, God's reasons for acting are oftentimes beyond our ken. Um, you know, God has reasons for doing lots of things that we don't immediately see, and so, you know, even if we can't really come up with some reason why God would choose to be alone, uh, we can rest assured that He would have some reason or other. Um, so that's one way to to flesh it out. Another one is just to say. Um, well, I mean, we might think that, you know, God would want to exist alone. Again, this is one reason. It won't, wouldn't be like an overriding reason. But one reason would just be, you know, reality wouldn't have any sort of diluted imperfections. You know, so reality as such would be just wholly, completely undiluted perfection. So maybe God wants to maintain that undiluted perfect perfection. Um, so that's another one. Um, and then finally, maybe he's just, he thinks that he's perfectly self-sufficient in himself. Um, and so he just simply chooses to refrain from bringing creatures into existence. Any, anything to add, Chris? Yeah, so I, th I think that's basically right. I mean, I, I, I want to emphasize that I think it's been important to the to the Christian tradition, independent of concerns about divine simplicity or classical theism more broadly, that God can exist alone. Uh, why? Well, because right, we think that God is perfect goodness it, it, itself, um, or is the is the most perfectly good thing um, that could exist. And so, when God chooses to create, He's not adding anything good to the world. Um, uh, he's not he, He's not making the world better, right? It's the world was already as good as it could be, simply in virtue of His existing, and having all the perfections that any creature possibly could ex have simply within himself, um, preeminently, in a higher way. Um, so when he's creating, right, um, he's doing so gratuitously. He's doing so not to make anything better for himself or to increase the, over, the overall axiological value of the world, but solely for uh, the sake of creatures, that they may, that they may exist and enjoy uh, the goodness that he gives to them. Um, although, of course, that is itself referred back to his own glory. It, all, it ultimately all comes back to his own glory. Um, but it, it's really important to hold this uh, precisely because it's, it's deeply connected with um, our, the Christian doctrine of grace, um, that grace begins with God's act of creation. He didn't have to give us existence, but he did. And then that overflows into, um, you know, he didn't have to redeem us, but he did. And so forth, right? That none of these things God does in creating or altering creatures is uh, for His sake um, intrinsically uh, or for uh, to make the world a better place. It's 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 for us. It's it's out of sheer grace. Okay, so we're, I'm still waiting for some more questions to to populate. This is one of our first times where we haven't had a whole lot of questions to go through. Uh, so actually it look, looks like we just had one in as I said that. So here's one from Matthew Galicia, Galicia. Chris, you mentioned earlier that all distinctions in God are human constructs, that they have no reality. So is his love and power identical to his being? Yes. Um, so let me just qualify the first part. Um, so all absolute distinctions in God have no, um, have no reality apart from uh prior to you know the uh distinction arising in in a, in a mind other than other than god's um or in god's own mind it, it could be either one um uh the trinity the trinity is relational distinctions that arise in god and, and that are real 
But uh, when we're talking about God's love and, and uh, power, um, we are going to say that those just are his being. Um, that comes back, I think, to the scriptural warrant for classical theism, right? Scripture tells us that God is love, right? Not that God is loving, um, but that God is love. He is agape. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I think that God's being is his love is um, probably one of the entailments of the doctrine of divine simplicity that comes through most clearly in Scripture. Um, yeah, so that I, I definitely... Uh, would concur with with most of what he said there as commitments of of classical theism. Um, I mean, there's definitely you know debates concerning that passage and you know whether it has that sort of ontologically weighty um, consequence. But we don't need to get into that here. I did want to flag just for at least uh, another element of this debate that um, that the audience can kind of come to appreciate, and it's really what's called uh, what's come to be called or this is a tool sort of in your philosophical toolkit in thinking about this, these issues. So it's, it's come to be called the truth maker account of divine simplicity. Um, and what it says, it's, it was actually, I believe, developed uh, by uh, Jeff Brower, Boiler Up, Purdue University. Um, so the truth maker account of divine simplicity says that, um, again, it goes with that distinction between predicables and properties, but it says that all predicables, we can definitely mean different things by the predicables, um, things that we predicate of God, like God is loving, God is just, God is one, um, yeah, things like that, God is wise. Um, and so we have these different predications, but what the truth maker account says is how we analyze this is that there is one single truth maker for those, all those different true predications, and it's God himself. So God himself is the truth maker for all these various, uh, you know, different predications that are true of God. Um, yeah, so like God's knowledge, why is that true? Well, because God exists. Like God God in himself is the truth maker of these various uh, predications. And so that's another element of the debate that we didn't really touch on, but it's one account. There are different ways to flesh out divine simplicity, and that's one way to flesh it out that, that would probably be helpful to listeners to be aware of. All right, we had another super chat come in. We'll get to this one, uh, throw it up at the beginning of the line. And we are getting some more questions in. So, uh, Silge Fredo says, in God's omniscience, I, one, I, does he know what it's like to be a sinner? And so he has the ability to take action by vengeance? I guess that's for me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah okay, take, so take a shot. Uh, well, let's say something about the second part first. He has the ability to to take vengeance. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think we all agree that he has the ability to take vengeance. <laughs> um, right. Is God's omniscience, does he know what it's like to be a sinner? Um, well, yes. Um, right. And I mean, I think it's actually really important that we affirm that, right? Because there's a sense in which God's mo God is motivated, in a sense, right? to become incarnate and to redeem us out of his empathy for sinners. He knows, he knows the lowliness of our, and the, and the des the desperation of our condition. Um, and that's what precisely what motivates him to become incarnate and to save us, to redeem us. Um, so yes, there's a sense in, in which he knows what it's like to be a sinner. Um, of course, it's important to qualify that by noting that he doesn't know what it's like to be a sinner in the way that sinners know what it's like to be a sinner, namely by being a sinner, um, right? Uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, God in his divine nature knows what it's like to see red, but in his divine nature he doesn't have eyes, and so he doesn't know what it's like to see red in virtue of seeing red, right? Um, he knows what it's like to see red and what it's like to be a sinner, um, in virtue of um, his causal, right, the way in which he uh, causes or permits, as the case may be, creatures to uh, see red or to uh, fall into sin, uh, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I don't have much to add on that. Um, there are certain, well, this would probably take us too far afield, but divine impassibility. So some, some thinkers um, argue that um, God couldn't be couldn't be moved or influenced by or, you know, um, or changed by or really affected in any manner, moved or influenced by anything ad extra to divine nature. Um, and so what these thinkers would argue then is that because of this, God can't have uh, empathy for sinners in response to sinners because then they argue that that would be sort of being influenced by or moved by something ad extra to the divine nature. We don't need to explore that here. I just wanted to flag that. Um, it's a sort of tangential debate uh, on 
um, on divine impassibility, which is uh, an entailment of divine simplicity, but we didn't really talk about impassibility much here. Couldn't you also make a distinction between propositional knowledge and non-propositional knowledge here? Because I think omniscience is really about propositional knowledge and not necessarily about like what it feels like to have some kind of sensation that that seems like more of a phenomenological or non-propositional type of knowledge. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm getting nods from both of you guys. So it sounds like that's a distinction that could be helpful here. All right. So I want to get to this question because I think this might help people. Chase Harrison says, are there any introductory works to get an acquaintance with this topic as a layperson? What would you guys recommend? Mm. Joe, you want to field that one first? <laughs> um, so here's what I suggest. I suggest you go log on to Facebook and you go to, well, obviously go and friend <laughs> Joe Schmidt for, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, so you log into Facebook. That's what you need to do. Number one, number two, find the group. Where's the, where's the number two? Oh, there we go. Number two, find the group called, uh, it's something called like classical theism versus theistic personalism, something like that. Find that group. Um, request admission. I can admit you because I'm one of the admins. And what we have in there are a bunch of documents that are like really good introductory or introductions to what classical theism says, what the doctrine of divine simplicity says, what are its commitments, uh, things like that. Um, That's and really so cool. that is the, you, you definitely need to be there. Um, Dr. Ryan Mullins has uploaded lots of different files for people to be on the same page as to what classical theism is. Um, I guess if you want uh, one single thing uh, that is kind of introductory that would really be helpful, um, Ryan Mullins has a paper called What is Classical Theism? And it's uh, it's forthcoming, and I think it's something like the Clark TNT Handbook of Analytic Theology or something. If you direct message him, I'm sure he'll be he'll be more than willing to to send to send you the paper. Yeah. So let me add to that that um, well, look, I mean, it, it it really depends on how familiar you are with the requi prerequisite philosophy. If you're not very familiar with it, then I would say don't read introductory works about classical theism. Go read works about uh, the philosophy of nature and metaphysics and try to figure out. Try to figure out what you think is true about the world first, because that's going to deeply inform right, um, uh, what you want to say about God. Right? A lot of the differences between Joe and I, for example, concerning the doctrine of divine simplicity are really just entirely derivative of uh, more fundamental differences between us in our, in our metaphysics, right? about whether we think that creatures really are composites of uh, essence and existence about uh, what accidents actually are and how they work in creatures. And it, it's only once you get that straight that you can get um, clear about whether this kind of composition takes place in God. Um, for, those of th for those who have done you know, a fair amount of basic uh, philosophy of nature and metaphysics, then, I mean, what I would suggest, I guess, is primarily the work of Brian Davies and, and Ed Fazer in terms of uh, contemporary introductions to classical theism. Once you feel like you know your way around the terminology, um, then of course you want to go read the primary text. You want to go read Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas um, because uh, you know no one's going to be able to, I think, definitively settle these issues in the secondary literature uh, without having, you know, gone and had, without going and having firsthand experience with the primary literature. All right, here's a super chat that was sent in by Joe Sharp. So thank you for sending this in, Joe. Thank you so much. He says, Thomistic, the Thomistic view of the Trinity is that the three person exist as subsistent relations within God, but how is this possible on divine simplicity? Relations of or between what? Right. Good. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so between the persons, right? Now, uh, you might say there, well, I mean, how can you have relations between the persons until you have the persons? And that's where the identity of the persons with the relations really comes in and becomes important, right? The, the father is his paternity. Um, and so uh, there the relations don't pre the re the relations don't presuppose the persons the relations are the persons um uh so insofar as god is you know um uh generating right um because he he has an intellectual nature 
uh, he's uh, related to um, to what is generated. But that relation just is the father. And insofar as he has a will, right, he, he's uh, the, the father and son spirate the spirit. But the spirit just is his relation to the father and the son. He, uh, he, he doesn't um, he's not presupposed by that relation. Um, yeah, I don't have much to add on that. Um, I mean, I, I, I would direct people to, because we talk about relations and relational qua objects. Um, it's a new phrase, but it's it's explained in the video. But I, I would direct people to, it's, it's a really illuminating discussion between Rob Coons and Ryan Mullins uh, on my channel. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, and then... Um, well, I, I should mention I too really... that I don't think I mentioned this yet, but your link, uh, your channel, I have it linked in the description of the video. So if people are okay. interested in watching your video and go subscribe to his channel, he's growing it right now. And he's, uh, he's doing a lot of really, really cool stuff. And it's, if you're interested in philosophy, religion, any of these topics, then you definitely want to subscribe to his channel. He, uh, he takes philosophy seriously. He's obviously super smart. So you definitely want to subscribe. Okay. Anyways. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I don't have too much to uh, just to add on. I mean, I can't really answer the, the <laughs> I can't really answer the question because I don't think it's possible on the, the divine, divine simplicity. But, you know, obviously we're going to disagree there. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, that's my that's my response. OK, let's get to another question from Guarded Acumen. He says, uh, and thank you for sending this in as a super chat. He's also one of our patrons. He says, Chris, are relations mo monadic, monadic? Predicates? What is that word? Monadic? That's the first time I've ever seen that. Um, well, monadic monadic properties um, only require one thing as a sort of instantiator, whereas polyadic properties are things like relations like taller than. It would be polyadic because it has two relata, whereas a monadic property, well, like being massive, like, you know, one thing can have that, whereas polyadic properties require multiple things to instantiate it. So that's kind gotcha. of a, a rough gloss. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, uh, so here's a question. Chris, are relations monadic predicates properties inhering in the relata, relata? If so, how would extrinsic changes in God not suffice to temporalize God? Ah, good. Yeah, right. So um, the answer to this question is, is that uh, the relations that make the change extrinsic to God don't inhere in God. They inhere in creatures. Um, so, um, yes, they're monadic. I mean, I, I don't... I, I, monadic and inhering in the relata don't quite mean the same thing. Um, so I'm just going to take the inhering in the relata reading um, and say, yes, relations do inhere in the relata, at least on the Aristotelian to mystic, you know, metaphysics of relations. Um, but the relevant relatum um, is is the creature, right? So when I say that, you know, God knew 65 million years ago that dinosaurs existed then and today he doesn't, um, well, back when he did know that uh, the dinosaurs existed, um, that, consist, that consisted partially in dinosaurs being related to him, not his being related to dinosaurs. Um, if you thought that he was related to dinosaurs, then yeah, that would definitely temporalize him, but that's not the view. Uh, the, the view is that the dinosaurs are related to him. And that's connected with what I said earlier about the fact that when it comes to divine knowledge, the direction of fit between uh, God's knowledge and the world goes in the opposite direction than it does for us, right? I conform my mind to the world, um, and so I'm related to the world um, in virtue of having to conform my mind to the world. But... Uh, for God's knowledge, the world is conformed to his mind. So the relation goes the other way, and it, it inheres in the things in the world, in the creatures. Yeah, okay. uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was anything directed Andrew? to Chris. Yeah, No, I mean, yeah, that was directed sure. to Chris, so it's fine. All right, at this point, why don't we do this? Uh, we've run out of questions, so why don't we go and do some closing statements, closing remarks, and then we'll close this, uh, this guy out. So why don't we start with... Uh, who should we start with? Let's do Joe, and then we'll give Chris the last word. So Joe, just give us a helpful summary, and then Chris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, no, so I definitely want to say thank you guys both. Thank you, Cameron, for, for 
hosting this. It was wonderful. And thank you, Christopher, for, for joining me. It was such a great conversation. I, I really loved it and benefited from it. Um, uh, again, the purpose of, of our doing this video is really to help equip you guys with the tools to sort of think critically and philosophically about models of God and especially divine simplicity. And so really, we just wanted to, this to be educational and to really help you um, grapple with these issues, maybe think about some different ways that, you know, thinkers have tested divine simplicity, um, you know, relating to Trinitarianism, alone worlds, different changing knowledge, things like that. Um, so it was mainly educational. And yeah, thank you so much for, for having me on here. And it was really wonderful. Yeah, no problem. All right, Chris, what you got? Yeah, so I want to thank you, Cameron and, and Joe, for um, facilitating all this. It's been fun um, and hopefully helpful to um, viewers. Um, so, yeah, once upon a time, you could not just go study theology. Uh, you had to first study philosophy before anybody would let you study theology. And that's how, you know, the university, as it originated in medieval Europe, um, came about. And there was a really good reason for that, right? Uh, it was precisely because a lot of theological disputes are philosophical disputes in disguise or dressed up in theological jargon. And so you really got to know the background metaphysics, the background philosophy of nature, and uh, all these other things in order to make sure everybody's on the same page with respect to um, with respect to uh, the background metaphysics before you can even figure out whether you're actually disagreeing about something theological or whether your disagreement's really you know just philosophical. And so what I hope what I hope that we've been able to accomplish is try to give people the tools to figure out what the various uh, controversies can surrounding divine simplicity are and how some of those controversies reflect more fundamental philosophical disagreements and what uh, people really need to know about the philosophy in order to make up their own mind about the theological topics. So um, that's what I would encourage people to do um, so we can kind of push the debate on divine simplicity forward in a productive way. So I, I let everyone know how to find Joe, but we I, I have your academia page linked in the description of the video. Is there any other place that you would like to, to send people if they want to find more about your work and what you're doing? Yeah, so I have my like academic homepage. That's firstphilosophy.net. Um, you can find links to, you know, my papers and stuff, although, you know, that's on academia too. Um, so, uh, you can find it in either location. And then I do have a blog that I very rarely update, um, called matter of Um, well, that's the URL it's called matter of argument. Um, and people can find that there. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks guys for coming on. It's been, uh, it's been really cool. Really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Okay. You, let me talk. No problem. I'm going to talk to the, uh, to the audience for just a second. So if you've been following the channel, you know that we're in the middle of doing 12 courses. So 12 beginner courses on apologetics. And uh, here's an updated list. This is actually not super up to date because we have a couple more episodes that we've recorded that I haven't put out yet, but I will be putting out in the next couple days. So these are the 12 courses that you can get if you sign up and become a patron of Capturing Christianity over at patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. I'll put it down here at the bottom of the screen. It's also linked in the description of the video. So if you're interested in apologetics, but maybe you're just starting out, you're getting into it. And also, if you already know something about apologetics, maybe you're even an intermediate or, or this, this might actually interest you if you're an advanced person as well. We've done, uh, so for example, I recorded the recent course on the Kalam cosmological argument with Dr. Rob Coons. We recorded that just a couple days ago and it was amazing. It was super, super good. He broke down the whole argument, his, his new sort of updated version with the Grim Reaper paradox and all these other arguments and everything to, to kind of rule out these other theories and stuff. It was just, it was amazing. And so it's going to interest you if you're a beginner, intermediate or advanced. So if you want to support this ministry, get your hands on these 12 courses for beginners, then go to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. The reason why we're doing this, when the reason why we're raising funds right now is because we're in the middle of doing our first conference. Man, I don't have it. Here it is actually. So CCV1, our first Capturing Christianity conference is happening in the fall of 2021. 
We have all of our speakers lined up. We're working right now on a venue. And so in order to make conferences like this happen a couple times a year, we need to raise funds so that we can bring someone on board. My wife, who is a, an amazing event planner, we're bringing her on board full time. So that's why we're raising funds and we're doing all of these really cool things that are, are ending up actually being really, really cool and really, really helpful. So I just wanted to let you know before we close this video out that this is available. You can get most of these courses right now over at patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. And again, it's to support the ministry. So thank you in advance if you're considering doing it. Thank you to all of our existing patrons that are supporting this ministry right now. I don't take it lightly. So that's going to do it for us today. Remember that Christianity is true. We'll see you guys later. Music